your studies in the spirit epistle, first Thessalonians, the apostles Paul writing this epistle to these young converts of Thessalonica, uh, which was surrounded with all types of Gentile place and Greece, surrounded by all types of sin and vice. And how Paul was going about this subject today. Paul was giving an exhortation what to abstain from, not to follow after the world of the way of the Gentiles. Last week, we looked at how Paul prayed for them. Um, the week before, we looked at how Paul sent them Timotheus, Timothy, to encourage them, and then gave them an epistle, the word of God, which is the most precious possession any person can have in their, in their midst. And of course, it's not just having it, it's a planet to our lives as you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you, ought, so you would abide more and more. For you know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour, not in the lust of concupience, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because of the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. And we'll just end our reading today at verse 8, knowing the Lord will bless this portion of Scripture to us this morning. Along with jogging, walking has emerged as a very, very popular exercise. And of course, there's nothing wrong with exercise if it's put in its right context. The Bible tells us all the exercise profits little. Rather, exercise yourself unto godliness. It has its place, as we're well aware, especially in this generation, our sports. Now, uh, again, there's not a wrong with sport, it's put in its rightful place, but sadly, sport has become an idol in many people's hearts. But nevertheless, jogging, as well as walking, has emerged as a very popular exercise, as well as, well as cycling. It does not take too long when you are travelling in a car to discover individuals as well as groups of people out walking, which involves all ages across the spectrum. If you go out through those doors right now, I'm sure you'll see people walking past the church under the pathway down there. The Christian pathway can be alluded to a walk in a sense. In fact, many times the scriptures exhort us to walk in the spirit. They've been singing here when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. The scriptures exhort us to walk in the light, walk in God's commandments, obedience to the Lord. The scriptures exhort us to walk in newness of life. If you're saved, born in the spirit, dear friends, you have a new nature, God's nature. You've been transformed, you've a new nature, so God requires you, which you should. Anyway, because you've caused nature within to walk in newness of life, you've been transformed, you're a new creature, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. The Bible exhorts us also to walk in love, to walk in humility, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. I'm called to be a pastor, some people are called to be evangelists, some people are called to the, the normal workplace, some people are called wherever, in the home place, wherever you are, the scriptures exhort us to walk worthy, wherever the Lord has you in his will, of the vocation wherewith you are called, to bring glory to his name. The Bible also exhorts us to walk in faith. The Christian pathway begins with the 
step of faith. But that step leads to a walk of faith. We're justified by faith. We have a right standing before God and God saves us by His grace. When we become new creatures in Christ, we're justified. But it also tells us the just shall live by faith. Present tense. It's not a past tense, one-off experience. It's to continue on walking by faith. Present tense. As we walk by faith and not by sight. Of course, when a person is out for a walk, they normally have a target to reach. Whether it's one mile, whether it's three miles, whether it's five miles, whatever, etc., etc. So as they are walking towards their target, they know they are making progress. You see, walking suggests progress. And we must, as true believers in Christ, progress, make spiritual progress in our Christian life until the end of life's walk, we will take our final step into the very presence of the Lord. Just like Enoch, what a great testimony. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Despite the wickedness and evil all around. And Noah as well. Many, many hundreds of years Noah walked with God. At times, folks, the battle can be raging, it can be difficult at times, but nevertheless, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. And God always gives us the provision and grace and strength and power to continue to walk with Him. Amos says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? I wonder this afternoon, are you in agreement with God? Are you saved, first of all? Are you in Christ? Is Christ in you the hope of glory? Are you in a personal, living, dynamic, supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you truly saved, born of the Spirit? Can two walk together except they be agreed? If you're not saved, folks, if you're still in your sin, you're not in agreement with God, you're actually under God's wrath. And you need to come God's way through Jesus Christ. I am the door by me of any man or woman that they're in, they shall be saved. Are you truly converted? Does God's Spirit dwell within your spirit, witness of your spirit? Shall you see them to the day of redemption? Do you know you're saved? Are you walking with God? A.W. Pink says, True conversion is the heart turning from Satan's control to God's, from sin to holiness, from the world to Christ. True conversion is the heart turning from Satan's control to God's, from sin to holiness, from the world to Christ. When Jesus Christ meets a sinner and saves him, folks, there's a total transformation. Yes. You're a new creature. The old does pass away. You've God's nature within. You're seeking now after holiness, after righteousness, after the things of God. You now belong to a new realm. You're in Christ now. You've been taken out of Adam. You're now in Christ and grace. In this chapter 4 of this epistle, the Apostle Paul describes a threefold walk for the Christian to follow. Today we're just going to discover the first walk in this chapter 4. The first walk the true Christian should be pursuing. And this is vital. This is God's ordained way for his people. And it is walk in holiness. Walk in holiness. Verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you will abide more and more. Walk in holiness. Jonathan Edwards is considered to be one of Americans' greatest intellects as well as theologians. Edwards was one of the leading theologians of his day and he pastored a church for 23 years in which he was part of the first awakening when revival came twice 
1735 to 1737, and also 1740 to 1744. This man was involved in revival. Edwards is known for preaching a famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He just read it out. Well, he was saturated in the place of prayer for two days or so. And he read the sermon out on God's conviction that the Spirit of God came into that meeting with such power. Such conviction that people were screaming for mercy. They thought they were sliding into hell as they were desperately hanging onto their pews and hundreds were converted at that meeting. Oh, how we certainly need conviction like that in, in these days we live in of lukewarmness, apathy, carelessness, no fear of God. And yet God is greatly to be feared among the assembly of the saints, rappers by century, the Son says. But despite Edward's powerful preaching, evangelism and writings, which has, has a great impact to this very day, Edward's main primary concern was his personal devotion, his thirst, his hunger, his walk with God, which included obedience, purity, holiness, virtue, and truth, which he called religious affections, being saved at the age of 17 and taken home to glory at the age of 55 as he walked in holiness for the glory of Jesus Christ for 38 years of his life as a servant. Edward's desire was to excel more and more, make sparks of progress, walking in holiness, getting to know God in a more intimate way. And that is God's purpose, folks, for every one of us, to get to know him more, fight to know him in the form of his resurrection. Daniel reminds us to know God, but then my people that know God, their God shall be strong to do exploits. Do you know God in a more intimate way today than you did 10 years ago? Are you walking closer to the living God? Are you making more sparks of progress? You see, there's always a danger of some Christians thinking they have no further need to spiritually progress in their walk of sanctification, but this is a deception as no believer in this side of eternity has completely fulfilled to its own capacity, God's desire for that person spiritually as we all come short. There's always room for maturity. There's always room for more knowledge of the Word. There's always room for spiritual progress. Even Paul realized the great apostle, he was not the complete article. There was still room to excel and make spiritual progress that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. He spoke to the church of Philippi. Paul's desire for these Thessalonians, even though they had made some spiritual progress, was to continue to excel by walking in holiness, pleasing God, abounding, developing more and more by obeying God's commandments. Verse 1 and 2, chapter 4. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk on the pleased God, so you will abide more and more. For you know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus. Since the 1960s, the modern sexual revolution has really accelerated, as morality is a thing of the past for many in this generation. We're now in a sex-crazed, pleasure-seeking, selfish generation. How low can it get? We had the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s. We had the homosexual revolution in the 80s and 90s. Now we have the transsexual revolution, in which the Lord has given some Lord a reprobate mind. Freedom of sexual expression has, in many ways, become the modern cultural god of this age. 
and to express their sexual desires at any cost, whether through fornication, adultery, pornography, immorality, homosexuality, and even to the extreme of aborting their own children. At the time the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to these Thessalonians, the moral climate in the Roman Empire was certainly not healthy, as immorality was a way of life. It was a very, very decadent society. Folks, it's not new over the sun. The city of Thessalonica was plagued with all types of immoral, sinful practices, as it was influenced by the mystery, false religions that advocated ritual prostitution and many of their temples dedicated, like the Anna and so forth, to fertility gods. So the Christian message of holy living, separation from immorality was definitely new to that culture, and it would not have been easy for these young converts in Thessalonica to fight the temptations all, all around them. The society was plagued with immorality. So to help these young believers of Thessalonica, Paul gave them a number of reasons why they should live a holy life and abstain from sexual immoral lusts. So first of all, the first reason we can pick out is here, what kind of sexual conduct does God require? Verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Everybody lives to please somebody. Either it's themselves or someone they love. Paul reminded these new believers that sexual immorality did not please God, and God commands his children to follow, to pursue personal purity. He said to the church of Corinth, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is our part, folks. We have to, it is the practical aspect of sanctification. We have to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God created sex and he knows what is best and has the authority to govern its parameters. Someone said God's commandments concerning sex are not for the purpose of robbing people of joy, but rather of protecting them that they might not lose their joy. So the will of God for Christians concerning proper sexual behaviour is that they should abstain from fornication, from sexual immorality. God's people have been sanctified, which is the process of being separated from sin. God's people do not practice sin. We do not continue it and set apart from God's holiness. God's people practice holiness. They walk in the light. Because we belong to Christ, He is our Master, He is our Lord, He is our Saviour. We're not ourselves, we're bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. Paul reminds us, but now being made free from sin, I tell you, the practice, the power of sin. Times we can't sin, I don't say that lightly, but God's people do not generally practice sin. The consistent pattern of their life is that they're free from the power of sin and follow after God's commandments and holiness. Paul says, But well, now we are made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. The sanctification process, you see, sanctification, folks is one package with salvation, with justification. When someone is justified, born again, sanctification begins in the Lord. It's a progressive sanctification. The Lord is changing his people from glory to glory, right through until we get to, to the state of heaven, glorification. 
And the sanctification process is a direct result of salvation, justification, as proof will be evident in a true child of God to at least some capacity. As Paul prayed earlier that these Thessalonians would be more established, unblameable, and holiness before God. We looked at that last week, chapter 3, verse 13. Paul's primary concern for these Thessalonians was their devotion to sanctification by abstaining from sexual immorality as sexual vice was rampant in and around the city of Thessalonica. I wonder today how many professing believers are spurning with sin. Sexual immorality, pornography folks, unclean images on the internet, how many are in bondage to it today? They're gratifying the flesh. Notice it said professing. Maybe some might never have been saved in the first place. But dear friends, any, any one of us can fall at times, don't be so speak that. But nevertheless, any believer, true believer who's born of the Spirit, who's been justified, and God is working through them in the process of sanctification, any true believer starts playing about with immoral images on the internet, like pornography and other things, sexual immorality, flirting with sin, God will chastise them. Jesus said, if your eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your hand offend thee, cut it off. God's people, you see, need to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the help of the Holy Spirit and by his word. Paul commands these Thessalonians in verse 3 to abstain. That you should abstain from fornication, sexual immorality. What does this word abstain mean? It means complete abstinence. Have absolutely nothing to do with it. Shun it. Flee from it. Cut it off. And the reality is, you can be on your phone and you can look at it someone proper, clean, and someone can pop up very, very quick with your phone. Dear friends, we need to cut that off. Don't flirt with sin. Don't give place to the devil. Resist them. Abstain means stay completely away from any thought provoking exercise or action or behaviour that violates the principles of God's word regarding sexual immorality. It is absolutely staggering. Joseph Maybe 17 years old or so, young Joseph, in Potiphar's palace. And this was the old covenant, folks. We're on the new covenant. We have the Spirit of God well within every one of us. We've been baptized with the Spirit of the Christ. So we have the advantage. And yet Joseph abstained when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. And I'm sure this lady was very pretty. She tried over for him. And he abstained from her. He, fl he fled the situation. And as a result, he was put in the prison for many years. But God in his providence was at work. And how he raised Joseph from the prison cell to the Prime Minister. You see, there's no excuse. Noah walked with the Lord for centuries. Enoch walked with the Lord for 300 years. There was evil and sin all around him. And I know there's a great temptation that's come in and passing through. The internet is a great tool of its use, right? But sadly, it has been abused. A multitude, some even professing Christ, are in bondage to pornography, to immoral images. There is no excuse, folks, because we have the Spirit within us. We have the full revelation of God through His Word. We have the resources. We have all things pertaining on the life and godliness in Jesus Christ. Jesus reinforces us by declaring that even the motive of the heart, if it is lustful toward another woman, outside of marriage, it is sin. It is sin of the Spirit. Even if the person does not actually commit physical sin with that other person, the sin of the flesh. 
God takes sexual sin very, very serious. If it is outside of marriage. God killed 24,000 Jews for committing fornication with the daughters of Moab, Numbers 25. Hebrews 13 says, Morris is honourable in all, and the bed on the five, with beer mongers, fornicators, and adulterers, God will judge. God's main desire for his people is to be holy. That is, is his will. That is his desire. Is this why the church as a whole, uh, as a general statement, is this why we're not seeing much power today in this province? Is people flirting with sexual immorality? People flirting with the internet, pornography? And the Lord even spoke a tremendous message the other night about grieving the Holy Spirit. Is the Spirit of God being grieved? You see, His purpose is our sanctification, that we might live separated lives in purity of mind and body. Well, so we move on very quickly here. Another reason why these Thessalonians and true believers in Christ should walk in holiness is to glorify God. Verse 4 and 5. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour, not in the lust of concubines, even as the Gentiles which know not God. All around us in this fallen world, there is all kinds of sights which could tempt our fallen flesh to immoral thoughts and sensual actions. But as believers, the body should the, the body should not control us, but we should control the body. He says in verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, and sanctification and honor. The believer should be in control of his or her body, not the body in control of them. The Christian pathway is a disciplined life, no doubt about it. As we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, abstain and mortify the deeds of the body. And verse 4 says to possess his vessel means to control his body. Self-control, that is one of the fruits of the Spirit, temperance, isn't it? Not overindulging as our bodies are the vessels of God to be used for his glory. The Apostle Paul reminds us that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, a vessel on the honour, sanctified and meet for the Master's use and prepared unto every good work. <coughs> The Christian either glorifies God and his members, his body, or brings shame to his own body by committing sexual immorality and robs God of the glory which is due to him alone. I trust today we are using our bodies, our members. What do we do with our eyes? What are we watching? Are we watching stuff which is not bringing glory to God? Or are we watching stuff which is profitable for the kingdom of God and our own walk with God? What about our ears? What are we listening to? Dear friends, the internet, I've said before, we have an absolute, we are without an excuse especially the people of God today because on the internet they have a multitude of tremendous preachers you can listen to what do we do with our ears what do we listen to what about our mouths how are we using our mouths are we using to edify one another to encourage one another to help one another to pray to God to witness for God or are we using them to downgrade people What about our feet? The places we're going? Our minds, that is so important. Are we renewing our mind day by day through the word of God? Are we renewing our mind through the trash of this world? You see, these are members of our bodies. How are we using them? Are we using them to glorify God by walking the pathway of holiness? Which is positive in verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Paul says, 
says that you should know this. This is an alien to you. This is a difficult. This should be the normal trend. Our reasonable service. On a trustful walk in the pathway of holiness, not in the pathway of the Lord which uses their bodies for self gratification, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, which is sensual. This is negative in verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. But finally, as we conclude here, why should a believer be sexually moral? What is the purpose of this? To bring glory to God's name. Verse 6 That no man go beyond and defraud his brother and any other, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. God is no respecter of persons and no judge sin. It says in verse 6, the Lord is the avenger of all. Even though true believers' sins have been judged in Jesus Christ, praise his name, forgiven, the Lord has paid the price of Calvary, one sacrifice once for all, and we are not under condemnation no more. But nevertheless, yet God in his government will chastise a disobedient, wayward child who is truly his, as they are not free from the harvest of sorrow that comes when they sow to the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. There is always consequences regarding sins. George Spurgeon says, God does not allow his children to sin successfully. God does not allow his children to sin successfully. A certain woman criticised her pastor one day, and there's nothing here under the sun, but nevertheless, a certain woman criticised her pastor one day, saying, why are you preaching against the sins and the lives of Christians? After all, she said, the life of the believer is different from the sins of the unsaved. Yes, replied the pastor, it is worse. Think of King David. The fatal consequences he had to experience and endure because of the sins of adultery and murder. His two sons were killed, Ammon and Absalom. His daughter, Tamar, was raped and he had lost his baby to Bathsheba. And there was civil unrest the rest of his days in his family and in his kingdom. His sons, Hobson and Ammon, were killed. Tamar was raped. There was unrest the rest of his days and his family and his kingdom. You see, there is fatal consequences in God's government regarding sin and the believer. The true believer is in a privileged position. Because sin does not have dominion over him or her. As with the unsaved, it is their master. They sin because they're slaves to sin. They have no power over sin. The true believer has a power, you see, within through the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, who has baptized us into Christ, who witnesses with our spirit, who abides within us, who resides within us, who teaches us, who energizes us, who empowers us, as verse 8 of our passage says, who have also given on us his Holy Spirit. To either yield, we have the power and the capacity now, to either yield to the things of God, the things of the Spirit, or to the flesh. Martin Lloyd Jones says, any true believer in Christ who is in bondage to sin is a fool. Because the provision, the resources are there, a sin does not have dominion over them. You see, folks, Paul has exhorted us in these Thessalonians in verse 7 For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. 
So if a person, especially a believer, yields to the flesh for uncleanness, sexual immorality, they are actually rebelling and despising God and grieving the Holy Spirit within. Verse 8, He therefore despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit, which in return will invite the judgment of God upon that individual. God does not allow his children to sin successfully, Spurgeon says. God calls his people to live a holy, clean life, free from sexual impurity, in which he gives us, he creates within us holy desires, holy impulses through the Holy Spirit himself, and the pure, unadulterated, indestructible word of God which sanctifies us. As we yield to the Spirit and we fill with the Spirit, He then empowers us to walk in the pathway of holiness and not be detoured with the flesh and pollution to this filthy world as the fruit of the Spirit overcomes the works of the flesh. God's standard is holiness. No matter about governments or their evil, sinful, immoral laws they pass, God's standard is holiness. No matter about governments or the extreme pressures, the immoral praying in our society today, or even some churches compromising, it makes no difference whatsoever, folks. God's standard is holiness. Isaiah reminds us, touchstone, clean thing. Be ye clean the fur the vessels of the Lord. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The message, folks, of holiness needs to be preached, I believe, more often in this province again, and needs to be revived. Is this one of the reasons why we're not saying what's blessing? It is either holiness, sins cleansed, walking in the light, Christ in you, the hope of glory, heaven, or it is sin, walking in darkness, Pollution, uncleanness, and if you die in that state, I'll say this in love, you'll end up in the lake of fire, hell, Gehenna, forever and ever under the wrath of God. Because, folks, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It doesn't matter what anyone professes. If they're not walking in the pathway of holiness consistently, you have to question why they're ever in the camp in the first place. The challenge is, are you walking in holiness today? The way Paul exhorted these Thessalonians to walk. As we, as we walk in the pathway of holiness, it is true evidence that we have experienced God's salvation in Jesus Christ. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. I trust as God's people today that we're not flirting with fornication, we're flirting with sexual immorality, but we're walking by His power, by His resources, through the Spirit and through the Word, walking in the light, knowing victory and bringing glory to our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Which pathway are you walking today? Are you on the narrow path? which is the pathway of holiness, or on the broad path, which is the pathway of destruction and darkness, which leads to hell. I trust today you know what path we're on. The Lord doesn't leave us to speculate. The Lord has given us that assurance. If you're truly saved, folks, you'll know you're saved. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things pass away. All things become new. The Lord bless these few words to us today. Thanks for your patience. We'll just we'll turn here to 594.